What's going on everybody? Uh, my name is Nico and I'm going to be showing you how to get uh, data for your projects. Uh, in this video series, we're going to be looking at how to get 3D data um, for a site such as this one. It's a mountainous site that might be uh, covered in forest and how we can uh, have, a, have some forest cover. And we're gonna learn how to generate the forest cover in a really smart way that'll save you a lot of time. What we're also going to look at is other ways to get uh, perhaps city data, you know, whether it's a series of buildings with a slight topography, uh, generate contour lines, as well as create road networks. Um, and we're going to do that a number of ways uh, that are kind of geared towards different approaches to your project and might be, what might be important to your project. Um, so sit tight. Uh, hopefully you find something valuable. And remember that, you know, this is a very, while this is a tech heavy tutorial, um, it's always worth questioning why you need this technology or why you need this data to produce what you're doing. Um, there's different levels of, of specific, uh, uh, specification that we go through and different levels of detail that we work with, but uh, some of them being as simple as what we're looking at here, where we were just starting to trace a screenshot from Google Satellite, it all matters that it all ties back to what you want to articulate in your project and in your story. Um, so while this one might be super simple and the contrary to that might be this uh, super contoured landscape with trees and so forth, they're all of equal value and merit. And it all just ties back to what you want to communicate in your project. Without further ado, we're going to get started. And uh, hopefully you find something interesting and valuable in this tutorial. Here we go. Okay, so the first way we're going to start by retrieving site data is we're going to grab this context in the city of Toronto around Casa Loma. And the program I'm using for this is Google Earth Pro. And Google Earth Pro is just like Google Maps, but you can uh, do screenshots. And so the way you do that is you first search the place that you're looking for, and then you go to File, you go to Save, and you go to Save Image. And this just allows you to take a high-res 4K uh, screenshot, which is pretty valuable. There's some map options here, which you don't really need. Like, I'm just keeping the scale and the compass on. But if you were to turn the legend and stuff like that, you see those things start to pop up. But really, we don't need any of that. We just need this as a reference. So we're taking the scale and the compass. Uh, let's go to Save Image. And then I can just name it Pass uh, Loma. And so now it's saved, just like that. The same thing can be applied in... Google Maps, it's just a bit, you know, there's a bit more distractions that you can't really turn off in the same way and it's a bit messier. But, you know, for instance, you could just do a screenshot. I just pressed Windows Shift S, the Windows key Shift S on PC, and you can just do this. And, uh, or here we can even do the snip and sketch here. And you just can do that. And there you go. So, <laughs> whoops. The downside of this though, I mean, just for mine is because since I have these key bindings to show you guys what I'm doing, this is also showing up, but you see there's still a scale bar there. You can still do exactly what I'm about to do that way. But I think everybody should download Google Earth Pro. It is free. And then, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to your desktop. You're going to take Casaloma and you're just going to drag it onto here. And then you're going to import it as a picture. You're gonna click okay. First corner of the picture doesn't really matter, but I'm just going to type W0, which will put it into the origin. And I'll just kind of click. And the next step is we're going to click it. And we're just going to zoom in. And we know our scale bar is here. So I'm going to type scale, SC for me. And I'm going to click this first corner right around here. It doesn't, it's not a science, you know, but here you go. It's good enough. And right there. And then I'm going to type 300 feet. And there you go. So that should be the scale now. We can, we can just create a new layer for this right now. Let's call it site. Or, you know, base site. So now I put it on that site and I've locked it so you can't click it with this little lock icon here. And we can just kind of check to make sure. So here's a road, for instance. 673.9 inches. So if we were to just type, you know, let's say 10 meters and see what we get. Whoops. Uh, 
and uh, we can shut on this smaller street here, two lane road. Yeah, so I mean, things seem to be things seem to be relatively making sense and and working. We can even we could technically go back to Google Maps here, for instance, either one of them. We can measure, for instance, the width of Walmart Road here. We'll just right click and we can do measure distance and we can just click here and there. So we know that Walmart Road is about 20 meters. And so now when we go back into here, if we were to do this, 20 meters. Okay, so we're in shape, we're good. And uh, kind of being the most brute force way of doing this, this, is, this comes with some trade-offs. Uh, first of all, this is a really hilly area and we're not going to get any of that because this is just an image plane. Uh, and second of all, what you're going to end up having to do is just manually drawing these houses. And frankly, it's not, it's not, the, um, it's not the end of the world, but uh, there's a lot smarter ways we can do this. And we're going to go over those. But I think this is a good starting point because it's always important to remember that this is, val uh, this is valuable information for your project. And you only need to express in the site context, for instance, something that you might think is valuable. Um, this isn't some obligatory exercise. It's something that you should consider when doing your designs and when doing your projects that how might the site uh, being the adjacent buildings and the um, topography actually influence your design thinking. And that's why it's a good way to start from this point of view because <laughs> by controlling everything, uh, or by drawing everything manually, you can start. You can start to decide what you think is important to your project. Um, and again, maybe I'll just quickly go over. You know, we could we could do a roads layer, for instance, and we could just do something like this. You know, I'm not going to go too crazy. You know, you do that, and then you can type fill it with a radius of let's try three. See what that looks like. Yeah. So. Three is really tiny, so it's by a fillet radius of 10. Still very tiny. Oh, because we're doing that in inches, that's why. So let's try, let's try uh, five meters. Okay, so we'll do 10 meters. We're kind of getting there. What did we say it was, 20 meters? Okay, so let's do this. So that's looking pretty good. We can fill it here as well, 20 meters. And you, you kind of get it, it just goes on and on. And then if you want to apply the width to the road, we'll just type offset. And then we can do through point by pressing T. You can refer to the commands up here. For uh, If you see the ones that are underlined, you can see uh, what exactly the button is you have to press and press enter following. So for instance, I want my through point to be here, but I want it to be on both sides of the offset because I drew this curve in the middle of the road. So I'm gonna press B now. Not a space bar, and now it's going to offset on both sides. And there you go. So there's a road. And uh, then we might want to have buildings layer. And buildings are just like this. You know, you can start doing things like that. And maybe you can, you know, start mixing up the sizes a bit. And overall, it's a very manual process. Uh, you know, and these are just kind of generic buildings and depending on what level of resolution you want in your context, we can determine how you want to draw things. Uh, but for instance, I'm just going to type planar surface. And now these are all actual surfaces. Um, if you turn this off, you can actually see that. They're all surfaces there. And what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna extrude these. These buildings are probably 10 meters tall. And you know, if you really wanted to kind of vary things a little bit, you can make these into pitched roofs or you could you know, select a couple of these and bring them down a bit and bring this one up a bit. And there you go. The way I selected just the face of this is by pressing Control, Shift, and then clicking. If I were to just click it, it would select the whole thing. So this is called a sub selection. Control, Shift, click. Just like that. And again, you can turn the road into a surface as well if you like, and you can add the curbs and so forth with similar modeling. But 
Um, overall, this is a very manual process, as you can imagine. Maybe your Casaloma is really important to your project, so you would take the time to actually model this. Um, but um, at the, ultimately, you're going to be missing the topography, because as we spoke of, this is a hilly site. Um, so what I'm going to do now is that was Google Earth slash Google Maps. And I'm just going to refer here to the next steps. So we've done that now. So we can kind of mark an X on that. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is called CAD Mapper. Now CAD Mapper uh, is an online program where you can basically get uh, city data and it'll kind of interpolate a lot of things from Google Maps to put them in all of the layers for you and so forth. And you can have this for AutoCAD, Rhino, SketchUp, Illustrator, and so forth. But the 3D programs obviously allow for topography, like 3D topography and so forth, while as Illustrator wouldn't. And so um, right here, you just have to search up your site. You create an account, you search up your site, and then you can type in the buildings, you, if, you, if the buildings are available, which they are in Toronto. And then if they don't have any data, for instance, some of these small buildings might not have any data, then you can just put in a false height. So 10 meters, I just, I kind of feel like these buildings are probably about 10 meters. Um, the other way to do this, if you don't want to have any false heights, maybe the building heights are really important. You can set it to like 50 so that you know, when you see a super tall building in the, in your file, you know, that's a fake building. And then here we have the topography and the topography is a 3D model and you can also contour it, which is just a sort of standard notation to express elevation uh, of a top topological surface. Um, I should mention too that this is free up until one kilometer square. After that, you have to start paying for it, but I think it does quite a good job for a one square kilometer. And you could technically like stitch these together if you wanted to. Um, but even when it comes to purchasing, it's not too expensive. I think it'd probably be like five bucks or something for an area much larger than this. And then, so here we are, and uh, just a reminder, this is Casaloma here, this is all hilly. And then for the road geometry, it'll actually create specific thicknesses for the highways, major roads, minor roads, and paths, just based on what you're specifying. And uh, this, this is where things might get a bit, you know, complicated because we know that that Casaloma road, Walmer road is 20 meters, and that's certainly not a highway. I mean, so we could probably put the highway up to, you know, 13, this could probably be 10, you know, 12, 15, minor roads could be nine, paths could be two meters, something like that. Um, and I mean, it just depends on the context that you're trying to get this from. So from there, uh, we're all set to go. This is my area. I'm going to create the file. So one peculiar thing about CAD Mapper, however, is that the minimum contour interval is four meters. Um, I mean, we'll just We'll put that in, but a four meter contour interval doesn't really, isn't really a standard notation. Um, it's a bit too spaced out. But with that said, we will do four meters. Um, we can put this up to 0 0.99 kilometers squared before, 0 0.99 kilometers squared before we have to pay for it. So I'm gonna click create file. And here we go. So it'll say, it says it's going to take about five to 10 minutes. So let's just hold on and wait and uh, touch back, uh, touch base. Oh, here we go. So here's a really rough idea of what's happening. Um, and then we can download that. So here's the file. And inside of it, yeah, we have another folder. So first thing we're going to want to do is just go to properties and unblock this. That's a, st a good standard practice for any PC programs. Unblock a zip file when you trust it. And then we're just going to drag that onto your desktop. And here's the 3D file. So what I might do, I will, I'll open this 3D file here. And so once we're in, we can start to see we have a pretty robust amount of data. We also have the topography and we have these contours. These contours we don't really want because we'll make our own contours. So I just selected the contour layer. I'm going to delete them. But here we are. So this is already looking much, much better. And the curves are all projected onto the roads and so forth. And, um, we just want to make sure it's in the right scale. 
So we remember that Walmer Road was about 20 meters. So we're just going to check here. Yeah, so that's that's good. So the last thing we want to do now, we have those site contacts and we have a bit of a hill, as you can see here. Maybe what we'll want to do is we'll switch to the contour layer. Maybe we'll make it like a dark gray of some sort. And then, so we're going to create our own contours. And to do that, we're just going to type bounding box. And then we're just going to press spacebar. What that does is it creates a box around the geometry you just had selected. And then I'm going to type isolate with both the bounding box and the topography selected. And now if I were to just hide this for a second, you can see all I have is the landscape and the, uh, the bounding box. Um, so I'm going to select, I'll go into here and I'll select the surface. And what I'm going to type now is contour. And I'm just going to start with an endpoint here. And so, so when you're doing the contour command, it tells you to start with a base point. So where do you want your contours to start? And where do you want your contours to end perpendicular, you know, as if you're slicing through this, like a piece of bread. So I'm going to click the top part here, and then, then I'm just going to type the distance between the contours, which I want to have at one year. And let's just see what happens. So there you go. So this is a way to get a bunch of city data. Um, up to one square kilometer and it's pretty clean. You know, you have already this all, you have all of this already um, outlined and so forth. So, you know, we can, uh, for instance, if we have parks, let's see if we have a park here. Yeah, so we have these parks. So for instance, we might wanna change these to green and that starts to make things a bit clearer. The difficulty now is since this is on since this is not a flat surface, it actually gets kind of difficult to fill these in. We can't just turn them into planar surfaces. So this would be a good time for you to uh, export it to Illustrator, for instance. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to show you a couple other ways to get this data. The third way I'm gonna show you is the city of Toronto. Uh, they have a website. And you know this is this obviously just depends on on um, which um, which municipality you're getting your data from. But essentially, the city of Toronto has a 3D model database, kind of like this. And it's worth noting that all these buildings are meshes, and Rondo uses polysurfaces, which is a bit different. So you might uh, have to expect some different results, especially when you do make 2D. Um, but as you can see, this might be a really good starting point for a render, for instance, or something where you want to get a sense of the buildings and so forth in the background. And to do that, you can just go to the opentoronto.ca slash dataset slash 3D massing, which is just up here. I can provide that link to you guys somehow. And once you're here, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of different data you can get from the city of Toronto, but once you're here, there's uh, these divisions that you can go through. So for instance, we can go to South Toronto. And let's see if we want to get our site. Let's see if we can get our site again. There's no, um, oh, maybe there is a tile locator. Let's, let's see if we type in Casaloma. Okay, cool. So it takes us to Casaloma. Okay, cool. So we want 50J. We can download both the AutoCAD and the SketchUp file. So let's download both of them and see what we have here. And one thing, <laughs> so one thing worth noting is you actually wanna do this. I don't think Google Chrome likes this, pro, uh, likes this exercise. So we'll actually do this from Microsoft Edge. Probably the only time I'll actually open Microsoft Edge, but we'll go here. I just copied the link into Microsoft Edge. I'll look up Casaloma again. Okay, so here's the here's this. Let's download this. There we go, and let's download this. And we can just kind of take a look at both of them. Um, now this is an AutoCAD file and this is a SketchUp file, but we can open both of them in Rhino. Uh, shouldn't be a problem. So let's just let them download. Okay, so this DWG file is all done. So we'll start with the DWG. I'm just going to take it. 
I'll open up another Rhino file. And what I can do is I can just drag this in here, do open file. No, I don't want to save changes to untitled. Uh, we'll have to check to see what units it's in, but let's just open this in meters to start and see if we got it, because we know the width of that Wilmer Road. Okay, so after like about a minute, that finally opened. And this is pretty slow on my computer, <clears throat> to be completely honest. And if you see here, so these buildings all look kind of messy right now. And this is because they're meshes. Um, but this is likely all, let's see if this is all 3D. Yeah. So if we were to go into textured mode, it'll, it should hide. And if, if this is uh, slow on your computer, like it is on mine, um, but okay, so here you go, you can see that. And you know, this is the, the reason why this is slow, frankly, I and mean, probably the reason we don't really need this uh, resolution is because, you know, all these buildings are pretty, you know, unless it's a, set, a single house, all these apartments and so forth actually have high resolution, which is, um, which is quite a bit. So what we might actually do if we go back to the, there, we can actually download the simplified SketchUp version. So we can just go there. You can already see that it's, and I'm going to, I'm going to assume that the SketchUp version of, of the complicated one is probably going to be just as slow. So I'm just going to not bother with this one just because it's a bit uh, painful to work with. Okay. So for SketchUp, you have to actually, for a SketchUp file, it might be best to first open it in SketchUp. Um, you should be able to get SketchUp, like a SketchUp basic for free, which will just allow you to export it as a OBJ. So let's just try and do that now. So this is, this is much smoother. And I mean, we can even look at this in SketchUp just as a reference point. Does it have any hill? So here's Casa Loma, and you can see here, there actually is no uh, topography data. Um, so this, this would work in some cases, but if you have any, you know, if you have a hilly site in any matter and you want to address the hill in your project, this might not be the best way to get the information. But uh, here again, so this is similar to CAD Mapper, but you can, you know, there's a lot more data because it's from the city of Toronto. Uh, there's a lot more resolution if that's something you really want. It might be good for a render. And then at the same time, you can see that your uh, green spaces and such are already hatched in and the roads are... Uh, are the true size of the roads in real life. So there's a lot more resolution that's going on in this project, uh, in this file than the CAD mapper one. Just gonna wait for those things to go away. Okay, so we've gone through now three. And the fourth one, Blender GIS, is actually my favorite. Uh, and it's the, I find it's the easiest. Um, and and we're gonna we're gonna go in through that now. And I think this is probably a good way to to really do things uh, for what we're interested in. So this is Blender. It's another free program. And I have a whole video series talking about how to work through this process. So I'm not gonna go into great detail, but I'm going to show you the process, just kind of show you how much easier it is. Uh, so there's an add-on called GIS, Blender GIS. Uh, again, I've, I'll show you how to install all that stuff in another video. But if you click it, you can go to Web Geodata. Then you can go to uh, base map, and we can just start off by having a base map. I'll press G, and I'll just type in Casa Loma. My zoom level will be 16, for instance. So it'll take us to Casa Loma. That might even be a bit too zoomed out, so let's try this one more time. Casa Loma. I don't need too much for this demonstration. I'll do a zoom level of 18. And when it says zoom level, all it means is it's just zooming in and out one scroll wheel. So this looks pretty good. Maybe I'll, maybe I will scroll in a little bit more and I'll just do enough just to get that hill and so forth. Then I'm going to press E. So I press E and already right away, this is a high resolution screenshot, just like what the one we got from Google, uh, Google Earth. And the next thing we want to do is we're going to go back to GIS. We're going to go to get SRTM, which is just NASA, uh, a links to NASA to basically get the elevation of the landscape. And this is pretty quick. It's not the most resolute 
uh, it's not, you know, the highest resolution, like the, uh, the highest resolution would be uh, doing it through GIS. But as you can see here, that's pretty good. I mean, that's kind of what we wanted and that took two seconds. We can do this for as much landscape as we wanted. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna plop the buildings onto this uh, topography. So I'm gonna go to uh, get OSM, which means get open street map, another open database. And now you just have to specify what you want. So like maybe you want buildings, we're just gonna click one and hold shift, highway, uh, natural, railway, and yeah, looks pretty good. They just say highway, but they mean really like any, any road. Um, so we're gonna do elevation from object, which basically means this is going to be, the buildings are gonna be re uh, based on the elevation of the topography we just set. Uh, the default height, Blender also works in meters, so the default height will be 10, as we had before. You can actually randomize the height so it looks a bit better. So, uh, you know, not every building is going to be exactly 10 meters. So maybe some will be, uh, you know, maybe some will be 13 meters and some will be um, 7 meters. So I just kind of created a threshold of 3 meters. And then uh, floor level height is 3 meters. So here we have everything. This might take a couple minutes, but we're going to click OK. Okay, so there we go. So as you can see here, these are uh, pretty basic extrusions, but uh, you know it really has everything you need for uh, for a lot of uh, context or you know th things relating to context. Here's our natural, uh, our natural layer. So we have a couple, uh, you know, we have a couple of layers to choose from and sort sort of analyze things. And you know, it's not perfect. I mean, like you can see, this is probably all natural but it depends on some database that they're getting this, these designations from. Um, or it might, it, you know, it looks like it's actually looking at the canopy cover. So that might be a way to actually put trees and so forth uh, into your file is just by, you know, using these as boundaries to put your trees in. So one thing though, is that these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete this natural for now. These buildings are meshes, similar to what we were experiencing in SketchUp uh, and AutoCAD that were um, a bit different. And I mean, these ones are a lot cleaner, as you can see here. These are just one face, but you should do some research the, in the difference between a mesh and a polysurface, which Rhino uses. Um, so what we're going to do, though, however, is we're going to take the top faces of all these buildings and we're just going to get the curves so that we can then export it to Rhino as just curves and make them into poly surfaces. And that's gonna be our workaround. So the way I'm gonna do that, quickly, uh, just a quick tip in, blend, in Blender. So I'm gonna click the buildings. They're all one layer, as you can see. So if I were to move them, uh, they all move together. So if I press tab though, I can now start to edit uh, any single one of these things. And so simply, I just wanna take the top face of all these buildings and to do that, I can just click one of these top faces and I'll press Shift G, or I go to Select Similar. And what I want is the normal, because essentially you have to pretend that there's an arrow pointing out of every single one of these faces. So for instance, the facade here might be pointing this way, this one's pointing that way, and then this top face, all these top faces are the ones pointing up, and that's what we want. So we'll go to Select Similar, Normal, we're then going to invert the selection by pressing uh, control I, and then we're gonna press delete, and we're gonna delete the faces. So now we have just the top faces. However, we don't even want the fill because this fill is a mesh, right? So I'm gonna select it again, and I'll just do shift G, select similar, normal. So I just did the same thing. I just pressed shift G that time. And I'm gonna press delete, and this time I'm gonna say only edges uh, sorry, only faces, just like that. So now it's really tiny. It's really hard to see, but if I go out of edit mode, you can see now we have these curves, right? And what's cool about these curves is they all have their actual heights, if you can see that. So we're gonna export this in, a, in multiple steps. The first one we're gonna export are these buildings. So I'm gonna do export OBJ. We're going to just save it to our desktop. And OBJ is just like a standard file format for a lot of programs. I'm just going to select it as my, I'm going to say my selection only. I'm going to say OBJ objects. 
And then the last thing I want to do is I want to change the forward and up, which just means the axes. And I'm going to change it to Y forward and Z up. Everything else should be fine. So I'm just going to name this buildings. And that's all done. I'm going to export the topography. File, export, OBJ. And all this should be saved. So I'll call this topography. And then, okay, so here, here we have rail. So maybe we'll export our rail separate from our highways. So we'll start with our highways though. And as you can see here, it does a pretty good job with the roads for the most part. They might have to do some like cleaning up and so forth, but we can do that all in Rhino. And you can even do it, you know, there's, there's tricks to do it to automate it, but then there's also sometimes you just might have to uh, manually clean some stuff up. But we'll export these, file, export, OBJ, and we'll just call this roads. And you see now things are just kind of picking up, going a lot faster. And then export. So I'm going to export the train, the railway, if you have any railway. And if you had anything natural and stuff too that you wanted to keep, then you would also just export that the same way. I'll just call this uh, rail. So there we go. So uh, so here I have a new file. I'm going to maybe I'll open this up in meters. Why not? To keep everything consistent. And okay, so let's just start bringing things in. So buildings.obj was the first one. So I'll, you drag it in and you don't do insert, you do import. Because insert allows you to just place it anywhere. Import will actually retain the information of, about where, where it came from. And since we have a bunch of different layers coming in, we need them all to overlay with one another. So I'm just gonna keep importing these files in. So this is the landscape. So I'm gonna take things and put them into layers as I bring them in. So I'll call this landscape, change that layer. I'll turn that off. All these curves, I'm going to join them. So they were all a bunch of loose curves and I just joined them into a bunch of closed curves. So I'll call this buildings. Just select all these, change object layer. I can even group these to be honest. And I'm just going to do sell bad objects to make sure there's no bad objects here and to test. Yeah. Okay. So these are, these are good. These curves are all very clean and uh, typically blender produces really clean curves, which is really nice. Um, so now what we need to bring in is the roads. We'll bring in the roads here and we can, uh, import that file, call that roads. Okay, so we're starting to, things are starting to take shape. And rail. And I'll bring that in. I'll just lock everything else. So now we just have this rail layer. Remember rail, change object to layer. And okay, so we're getting there. We're almost there. <clears throat> So one thing that we're missing now, obviously, is the actual extrusions of the buildings. But we have everything we need to make it work. Um, so we can turn roads off, rail off, and layer five is nothing, so we'll just delete it. Uh, so I mean, there's a number of ways you can do this. The easiest way, we'll just unlock the buildings layer here. We're just going to select everything, and we'll just type extrude, curve, and we're just going to put it just ever so slightly below the topography. And it's better to be safe than sorry, because all these are coming from different heights. So there's no, you know, since this topography is kind of going to be a mask for the undersides of these, you could technically go this far and it would have no repercussions. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select all of them. I'm just going to type cap. 
And then now I can turn off the original curves. And there we go. There you have it. So one other thing that we probably want from our landscape would be our contours. So I'll just, I just created a sub layer on the landscape and I call that contours. I select that, I create a bounding box. And then I'll contour. And then I'll just type one meter. And you know, maybe we, for the sake of this, we can do that. We could technically make the, you know, if we wanted to keep this satellite view, we could make it darker so that the curves would show a bit better. But right away, you're starting to see and get an idea about how, how many different ways there are to do this. Um, so we have all that. Then we can turn the roads back on. We can turn the rail on. And now it's just a question of what you want to do with it. So that was a urban context. I'll just name this. I'm going to save it in the Casaloma. And I'm just going to show you one more time now in uh, maybe perhaps a forested context. So this was our, this was Casaloma. I'll save this file too. And I just create a new file. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go even faster this time. So I'm going to get a base map. Click OK. I'm going to type in Jasper National Park. I'll go to a zoom level of maybe 16. Just go to Jasper National Park. And I'm going to go to a zoom level of 16. Let's see where that takes us. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is great. We've already done the city city part, so I think this is probably better. And we can so we have the mountain here, and we have the trees and so forth. We'll go ping NASA. Hey NASA. So we're pinging them again, and this will be a good example of you know ways to put in trees and so forth into your project. There you go. Look at that. We will, you know, we'll just, you know, honestly, there's no point in doing the buildings because really there is no buildings. This is a pretty, um, you know, this is pretty clear in terms of what, what we're interested in here. I think maybe if we were to put anything on this, it would be trees. Um, so I'll, I guess I can quickly do that. So I'll, I'll show this in Blender and uh, I'll do this more in depth. I've, I've done this more in depth in another video. So we're going to do this in a... Uh, a blender way, which I think is quite interesting. So the first thing we're going to do uh, is create a particle system. Now, mind you, one thing I've done here, I'm actually going to run you through it because I just had to troubleshoot something. This was the original. Um, whoops. This was the original. And I've just gone to the, mod the modifier pane here uh, and applied these modifiers which are, are what allow, you know, because this, this started off as an image and then when it became topography, they just created these two modifiers. So I'm going to apply these just to make it permanent. And now if you go into edit mode, you see there's a bunch of tiny faces and we kind of, we need that for this next step. Uh, because if we don't, you know, if I undo this a couple times, and this is to talk about meshes again, if I undo this and I go into edit mode, this is actually just one big face, see? So, you know, frankly, I don't even necessarily need to apply both of them. I just need to apply this top one, which is subdividing it. Now it's subdivided and then we can start to work with this a bit more. So I'll go to this thing here called particle properties. I'll make a particle and I'm just going to call it trees. And, uh, the only other thing I'm going to do is maybe I'll create a cylinder. Yeah, so we have a cylinder there. I'll press period to zoom in, just so I'm looking at just this guy. And uh, I'll change the view, clip start to one meter. So this just allows me to zoom in a bit more. Okay, so we have this thing now in our collection. We'll call it 
tree. And uh, I mean, this could be any tree, right? But I'm just gonna use this cylinder as a tree, kind of like just having posts as trees anyway. And uh, I'm just gonna move this up. You know, this isn't really a science. I'm just gonna measure this to see how tall it is. Yeah, why not? Tall trees. It's an old, an old you know, let's make it even a bit taller because it's, uh, you know, this is like not in a, this isn't a city tree. This is a pretty big tree. Maybe I'll make it a bit thicker too. So there you go. Okay, so I'll, I'll mold done with that now. So we'll just let this guy hang out over there. I'm going to just turn it off and hide it so I don't do anything to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the particle settings of this guy, of the landscape, and I'm going to turn into hair. I'm going to turn on advanced, and then I'm going to go to render, and then as opposed to rendering it as a path, I'm going to render it as an object. The object I'm going to pick is our tree, and what you might see are very little tiny things that are lying on here, and that just means we need to manipulate our settings a bit more. So first I'm going to make these big. These are going to be really big. Second of all, um, we're going to, uh, we're going to get the object rotation. Okay. So we, what we'll do, so object rotation sometimes works for specific things, but one thing that always works is we can do object rotation and we can just do none. There we go. And the other thing we're noticing obviously is that, uh, these trees are all over the place. But if we look at this map, if we look at the topography, we know that we only want them, them to be in these sort of darker areas. So we're going to, what we'll do is we're creative, we're, uh, we'll go down here to this little triple triangle, this triangle thing called object data properties. We'll create a vertex group called trees. And then we'll go back to the particle properties for our trees particle. And we'll go to vertex group and then we'll specify the density of the trees where they appear based on that uh, vertex group. And what a vertex group is, is we're just gonna paint onto the landscape and assign it to that vertex group. So we'll go to weight paint and then it's super easy. We're just gonna paint. And what you see is as I'm painting, it's just painting with the trees, just like that. And you know, if you press shift and F and stuff like that, it can affect the density of it because you're really just painting and it shows you a heat map and you can even change the, uh, the opacity of it. So we have a general idea, you know, maybe we want something like this so we can see where we're painting. And then we look at that, just painting a forest. Look at that done. It's a bit denser in the middle, obviously, cause, uh, you know, things like that happen and maybe I'll make it super light, a little bit of weight, and then I'll just start painting a little bit here because it looks like there's a little bit of sparse trees here. I'm pressing F to affect the size of this thing. And then shift F to affect the density of it, kind of just like Illustrator or Photoshop and stuff like that, that have a similar function. So, you know, there we go. It doesn't have to be accurate, but just get the point across, right? So there we go. We'll exit weight paint mode, go to object mode. And there we have it. And obviously, so this is just a, this tree is a placeholder, but you know, if we, let's see if we can, uh, not bad. You can imagine that these could be anything. This could be a lollipop tree. And the cool thing about that, you know, for the sake of this demonstration, maybe I'll try this. Uh, maybe you want this to be a lollipop tree. So we'll just quickly create a, we can quickly create an ecosphere, for instance. Do something like this, radius. We'll say a radius of six meters. You know, this isn't really my style. Even if this is a realistic tree, I mean, probably wouldn't really be my style, but there you go. So I just edited that 
Whatever I change to this one will affect all of them. And uh, there you have it. So uh, one, I guess one difference though, is if you were to apply all these when exporting this to Blender, it would, uh, you know, this is super lightweight because they're all kind of, they're all just referencing this one guy. But uh, if we were to export this to Rhino, it actually would cause your computer to slow down quite a bit. So while the landscape is good, the trees, um, the trees, we, we can actually do the exact same thing that we just did here in Rhino in a slightly different way. And it needs, it needs a bit of grasshopper, but we can do it. Um, so just quickly, and I, I've done this in another video before, so I'm not gonna go as in depth because you, again, you can watch this same video that goes through all this stuff uh, in particular. Um, but what I will do, is I'll set it up for you. I'll set it up uh, for people watching this video to make sure that they can um, export this to Rhino. Okay, so we're gonna try and create the same sort of forested condition in Rhino, uh, but we're gonna use the reference points from Blender here. Because and um, the reason why we don't want to just bake this over to Rhino is that all these trees that would would then become real geometry, and it might slow down your Rhino file. It's kind of nice to have these as just particles as opposed to real geometry, because it's just referencing this one tree, which allows us to change this one tree and then everything else will change with it, kind of like blocks in Rhino. So that's what we're gonna try and recreate in Rhino. And uh, this is really, we have, I have a full tutorial on this in another video and I'll link that again, but I'll do this quite quickly to um, just kind of show you how to get your geometry into Rhino. And so I'm gonna select and edit this uh, geometry here. I'm actually gonna get rid, I'm gonna go into X-ray mode, or I'm just gonna select everything. I'm just gonna get rid of it all. I'm going to do that, and now everything's gone in that tree layer, uh, but the layer still exists. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a circle, just like that. And now, uh, if things are working correctly, if I were to edit this, yeah, you can see there's actually a ton of tiny little circles there. So what I'm going to do, because circles are lightweight, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert those circles. And now we have a bunch of tiny little circles here. So I'm going to select those circles. I'm just going to join them as one layer. I need to select one active object. So I'll just select that one, click join. Whoops. Hide this for a second. So I've joined all those layers. I don't need the particle setting anymore. So I'm going to be a bit more, <laughs> going to be a bit more careful. So these are all the trees now. I'm going to select them all, join them. We don't need this particle setting anymore. And we're just going to select the landscape and these, this circle group. I'm going to go to File, Export, OBJ. I'll call this Jasper 2 because I secretly messed this up the first time. And uh, through video editing, I am hiding that. But hopefully this time will work out a bit better. So that's been exported. I'll go into my new Rhino file. And I'll bring that in. I'm going to import that. Okay, cool. And so uh, this is exactly what we needed. Great. So we're going to use a little bit of grasshopper for this. Don't get scared. We'll be okay. Uh, but as you can see already, we have this great topography, this great site data. And now what we need is we're going to use these circles as reference points. And similar to like what we were just doing, uh, we can create a... We can create a circle again, um, like a one meter. Ah, and we also need to make sure this is the right scale because I don't think it is because uh, I have my document in inches. So that's why. So I'm going to create a new document one last time, large object meters. Let's just bring this in, import file. Great, great stuff. So I'm going to create my tree now. I'm just going to make it a radius of one meter. Why not? And then I'm going to 
extrude that curve and I'll say 20 meters. Again, why not? <clears throat> and okay, so we have that and we have our tree. So what we want to do, our, our tree is super tiny, but it's right here. And then here's all of our points. So we're going to make our tree, which is hiding over here. So I'm going to make it a block. And I'll just put its block point there. I'll just call it tree. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Grasshopper. While this loads, um, I'm going to show you a plugin that we need for Grasshopper. It's called Scatter. And again, this is all optional. Obviously, you can just kind of put things on the landscape if you want, but uh, here's this thing called Scatter. You can download this, and then we can follow, you can follow along with me. You can just download Scatter 2.1. You can even get a free plants package from him here and even watch kind of in detail how he uses it or how he's created it. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do, though, really quickly, so I'm going to type Scatter. Maybe I'll turn off Karnak for this one. just so it's not getting in the way. So we know that these are all the points that we want to move our tree to now. So I'm just going to reference those by creating a geometry node and then saying set multiple geometries. Uh, but the thing is we want like one specific point. So I'm just going to get the area of those nodes. And these, are, these aren't these are closed circles yet. So I'm just going to select them and I'm going to, I've just selected everything and said click join. This might take a second because all those circles are becoming closed curves right now. And so here's an example as to why uh, we're doing it this way is because we're going to be transferring 31,000, 32,000 curves into just one block instance that gets repeated a bunch of times. Um, and in particular now, so it's 1,000 closed curves into one block instance. So you can imagine how much better that would be for your computer when showing big landscapes like this. So again, 999 curves, I'm going to select multiple geometries. So they've all been highlighted. I've now got in the centroid. I've I typed in area right here to get the centroid of each one, which is that point. And then I'll just create an XY plane because we want our trees to be facing upwards. Uh, so that's it. So then once we've done that, and if that doesn't even make sense to you, that's fine. Just follow along for now. And then we need our tree here, which goes into here, set one GUID, just click that. You could even have multiple types of trees if you wanted to, technically. Uh, you know, maybe I'll create like a, you know, Okay, so I just quickly made, uh, whoops, I just made a, a couple more blocks. Uh, again, you just can create whatever geometry, you can just type block, and then whatever you, whatever you have selected can become a block. So I have three blocks now, I can select them all, and it says, I'll right click this ID component, and I'll say set multiple GUIDs, so one, two, three. They've all been selected now. Uh, I'll turn the preview on for this. I'm going to save this. It's always good to save things before you do big things like this in Grasshopper. Just named it Jasper. And okay, so I plugged it into the plane. There we go. So we're getting now a preview of where everything's going to go. And there's a couple other settings you can play with, like your rotation. Your scale, so some can be bigger, some can be smaller. You know, your scale X, scale Y, you know what I mean? Seed. So suddenly you can have a pretty interesting landscape um, with quite a, you know, quite a bit of natural looking elements with not much work. Uh, and then we're just gonna run it. And then we're just gonna turn it back off. This could actually just be a button, but you know, whatever. Let's turn this off and we'll just disable the previews. We'll install the curves because we don't need them anymore. Actually, we'll 
we'll internalize them just in case, but we don't really need them anymore. So there you go. Now we have a bunch of eggs, triangles, and uh, uh, bowling pins sitting on our landscape. And the, the nice thing about this though, however, is that if you were to change anything from your tree layer down here, your tree blocks, you know, for instance, maybe I want this to be a snowman. And then I can click OK. When I go back to the landscape, we now have a bunch of snowmen. So these are, um, these are just ways that you can start to work on things uh, between programs and get, get uh, data uh, for your project, depending on what you're trying to depict, whether it's a city, uh, whether it's a, some form of analysis across a landscape like this, maybe. Um, or if you just really just want to trace something from Google Maps um, to start to fulfill your project narrative, these are all interchangeable and can kind of work in tandem with one another, but it also depends on what your project is about. Um, you might not need an entire 3D landscape like we're looking at right now if your project is just about, you know, something that's rat, you know, something that might be better expressed in plan. This is good for 3D information. Especially since we already have all this like information as an image, it's so indicative already of what's happening in the landscape. But anyway, with that being said, so let's just quickly go over what we learned. Um, so, you know, here we have this landscape and we have, uh, we've been able to get the topography, the rich topography data, and also the tree data and uh, been able to populate it with our own custom trees, for instance, in Snowman. Uh, we used Blender to do a lot of this and to kind of create a valuable workflow between the two of them. We were able to use uh, web platforms like OpenStreetMaps, uh, or sorry, this was actually also from Blender. We were able to use Blender here, and you see it actually changed the, uh, it changed the image here, which is kind of funny. Um, but we were, we were able to use uh, Blender to uh, also get city data and work with city data there. And, We had also done it the manual way and started to look at how we might be able to do ma uh, manually draw things based on what we're interested in for our project, which is something that we should always critically ask ourselves. And we also did a CAD mapper version as well, which is an online one that does a lot of the work for you, but uh, also hides a lot of the design op options for you. So uh, that's, that's that. I'm, we're also going to uh, uh, detail a uh, illustrator sort of component to this as well, which will be the next step. But um, this was the beginning portion of it, all featuring and looking at how to get data and get and uh, let's see if there's anything else in my notes here. Yeah, so there you go. So again, it was Google Earth slash Google Maps, CAD Mapper, the city of Toronto. Uh, which I didn't just review, and then Blender, Blender JS. Uh, hopefully, you found that helpful. You can always email me or contact me if you need help troubleshooting and so forth. I know some of this I went through pretty quickly because there's other resources that I've already made that go through a lot of this in detail. Um, and this is more about just where you can get data from and what you might have to do to synthesize that data into information because data isn't very valuable unless it's synthesized into information. Thank you very much, everyone. Till next time.